I've got Sharon Isbin here on the line with me, and of course we've talked with you before about some of your other albums, Sharon, but I, I just want to say, you know, if you don't know who Sharon Isbin is, she is, well, I'll just say you're, you're the greatest guitarist in the world. How about that? Can we go well, with that? Well, that's... That's making me blush. I don't know if it's true, but it's nice that you think that. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you are well known for not only recording many wonderful works, but commissioning works. I mean, you've probably commissioned more works from uh, living composers than any of the other guitarists out there working. And you've recorded a good deal of them. We're going to talk about a, a couple of recordings today. This is really a bounty of riches um, the one recording is called Affinity, which contains uh, world premiere recordings on it, including all works that were written for you. And the other one is called Strings for Peace, which is a completely different album. But let's go back to Affinity and talk about that. Um, that takes its title from the guitar concerto that Chris Brubeck wrote for you a few years back. Do you want to tell us about, uh, about his concerto to begin with? Well, the title itself expresses an affinity for many things. In a scientific level, it, it is, is about the idea of a, an attraction or force between particles that causes them to combine. That was something that he, he thought would strike a chord of recognition since I come from a science background as well. And yeah. affinity that Chris and I share for each other, that we share for different genres of music and different styles of playing different instruments, different countries, travels, and unity between different worlds combined in travel. All of this comes into play in his music, in, into the concerto that he wrote for me. And it ends up being really a metaphor for the entire album, which combines composers from three different continents. You've got Cuba, America, China, Persian American, and South America. So all of this together is a, is a, a real journey and experience of of harmony in a in a new and exciting way. The concerto itself, Chris is of course comes from a, a jazz background, and his father, being Dave Brubeck, is is someone who influenced the piece as well in in a way that we didn't expect would happen. Um, Chris is is someone who is such a, a nice person and really remarkable in the way he invited me to do something that no other composer has ever asked before. And I've at this point had have had a dozen works for guitar and orchestra written for me and over 80 in total of different things involving the guitar. So he called me up one day and he said, I'm, I'm in the process of composing and I'd love to, to stop by and just play for you some things that I've sketched out. I said, sure. So he did. And he said, what do you think? Is there anything you want me to change or do differently? And I said, you're asking me to, to critique <laughs> you while you're writing? And he said, yes. And I thought, wow, this is somebody who really has a some, tremendous sense of, of core and self-confidence and strength and courage to be able to open himself up in a vulnerable way like that while he is writing. So I took him up on it. And I would give little pointers here and there. And on a next visit, when he played the slow section... It was in a jazz style, and I thought, you know, this doesn't quite move me. And I said to him, I didn't say that. I said, Chris, <laughs> I said, you, you lost your father, Dave Brubeck, recently, and your mother. And I said, is there anything about that that you would like to pay homage to them, maybe even including something of your father's music? And he said, oh, I'm so glad you asked. He said, I really wanted to do that, but I was afraid you, you only wanted my own music. And I said, no, I want you to, to do whatever is in your heart, compose whatever you're feeling. So he sent me some songs that his father had written, and he said, why don't you choose something that you would like me to in incorporate? And both the conductor, Elizabeth Scholz, and I, she's the conductor of the Maryland Symphony Orchestra, we ended up premiering the concerto, and is she joined me on this recording as well. We both gravitated right away to a, a gorgeous ballad called Autumn. And this is something that Chris had played with his father and felt very connected to as well. So without my any further prompting, he ended up taking out the slow section and replacing it with this beautiful ballad that he orchestrated. And it forms 
the heart and soul of the piece and, and on, on either side of that you have virtuosic guitar writing and elements of jazz and Middle Eastern music and a, a, a rowdy, rambunctious, exciting ending. So it really changed the course of, of, of the, the music itself by his invitation to, to be part of it. It's just fun to listen to, I should say. I also hear a little bit of is it flamenco in there with the hand claps going on? Yes, you're, you're right. There is a little bit of that going on as well. And that's, that's just part of the world journey that he wanted to incorporate in the piece in subtle ways. You've got some other composers on here. Very different approach comes from uh, the Chinese composer Tan Dun, who is known for his work in, in film, but also, of course, for his work in the concert hall. Can you talk about his concerto that he wrote for you? Well, the concerto he wrote a number of years ago called Yi Tu, and after that, it was it was just such a, a successful experience that he said, I'd like to write a solo work for you based on, on this. So hmm. he came up with something called Seven Desires for Guitar, and the desire of the guitar is to become a pipa. A pipa is the ancient Chinese lute, and Tan Dun incorporated into the score elements of flamenco music that relate to the guitar's Spanish heritage and elements of folk tradition from China with the pipa. And as you may know, Tan Dun was a victim of the Cultural Revolution in China, forced to become a rice farmer, banished from playing any Western instruments. And during that time, he researched folk music and played on whatever he could he could get his hands on, stones and, and uh, pieces of nature and water, and paper, any, anything. And that then all changed when a freak accident happened and members of the Peking Opera Orchestra when her boat all drowned and the government was forced to recall people like Tan Dun back to the capital to play his violin in the orchestra. And he was able to make his way from then to the United States and the rest is history. So you'll hear in this music by Tan Dun elements of ritual, whether it's the wailing at a funeral or celebrating a wedding or a march, and you'll hear the pipa effect where the pipa would be using plectrums and I'm using my fingernails to sustain it and suspend notes and pitches. All of that is, is just such a, a rich canvas of colors and sounds. <laughs> I've never heard the guitar actually treated that way before. I'm sure there are pieces out there, but it, it seems like a really unique uh, work of music. It, it, it is, and I certainly never played anything like that before. Uh, you've got some other works on here, including your collaboration with uh, Isabel Leonard, who you recorded that, that wonderful uh, set of songs with for the Spanish Soul album. Alma Española, yes. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, her Richard Daniel Poor uh, performance? Yes, this was a commission by Carnegie Hall for the two of us, joined by the Harris Theater Chicago, and it was for Carnegie's 125th anniversary, and they wanted us to include a commission in our recital that we were doing at Carnegie Hall. So uh, it, it was such a strange coincidence because I got the notice that Carnegie wanted a composer commission for our recital, and the next day Richard Danielpour, who I'd known for years, called me up and I hadn't heard from him in years. And he said, Sharon, I've been thinking about you, and I, I just have this desire to write a piece for you to do with a singer. I, I want to compose this. I've already got the sketches in my mind. And I said, Richard, did you know that I was performing with Isabel Leonard? And he said, no, I had no idea. What, what are the chances of that happening? So it kind of, everything fell into my lap and, and into place. And he became the composer we chose for this project. The 
poetry is written by Rumi, the great Persian poet, and there are actually erotic love stories that are part of, of the, the, the tabla of, of the music itself, and it celebrates birth, death, and dancing in a folk tradition, so all of that is in, is in the music. You have the, the love stories of, of Rumi, uh, that kind of parallel, I guess, the, the African love stories found in the Leo Brower piece. That's right, and El de Camaro Negro is, is a work that Cuba's best-known composer, Leo Brower, wrote for me some years back, and they're inspired by African love stories collected in the 19th century by a German ethnologist, and they're very descriptive in their style. You have a warrior who is beloved by his tribe, because he has saved them from many an attacker, and then when they discover that his passion is to play the harp, they banish him. So there's one section where he creates the sonoric image of riding on horseback through a valley of the echoes, and he has fast triplets that alternate between loud and soft, and you can actually feel that sense of of being spirited away through this valley. last ballad is called uh, La Doncella Enamorada, the ballad of the maiden in love, and this is a, a very different flavor. You've got the, the African call and response in the opening, and you have the contrast between the, the beautiful lyricism of a woman walking with her hips swaying, contrasting that with these energetic, fiery, virtuosic sections. So the piece is very rich in its, in its color and its expressivity. The last piece on here, I'll mention it quickly because I do want to also talk briefly about Strengths for Peace, uh, a, a waltz uh, by Antonio Lauro, which I guess was arranged for two guitars by one of your uh, former students. Yes, I had an experience some years back playing in Caracas, Venezuela, and I was at a party and someone passed me a guitar and I began to play this waltz called Natalia which is named after Lauro's daughter, Natalia, and who should be at the party but his daughter. So Natalia uh-huh. picked up a cuatro, a Venezuelan folk guitar, and began to improvise chords and strums in a folk style. And it was such a fascinating and beautiful experience that I've always thought someday I'll find, I hope, somebody who can write a second guitar part that I can play this with. And sure enough, I began doing some duet concerts with my former student, Colin Davin, And in that process, I discovered he was a marvelous arranger. So I asked him to write a second guitar part using this folk style. And what he came up with was so beautiful that I included it with him playing with me in the album. And it's that that beautiful waltz by Antonio Lauro. It's a, it's a fantastic collection and so interesting and the music so varied yet related as you say through this concept of affinity um, let's talk very quickly about Strings for Peace both of these albums came out at the same time from the uh, Zoho music label Strings for Peace is all about uh, North Indian music can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, about a dozen years ago, I received a message from Amjad Ali Khan, who's one of India's foremost sarod players. A sarod is an instrument that is metal, it's played with a, a plectrum, and there are no frets. And he comes from six generations in his family of sarod players, masters, who have actually helped to evolve the construction of the instrument itself. So he said he'd love to... to to meet and explore the idea of a collaboration. And instead what happened was a friendship developed between him and me and his two 
virtuoso Sarad playing son, Zaman and Ayana Ali Bangash. And every year we, we would often meet in New York when they would come to play a concert. And they would say, we're still working on the project. And I, after eight years, I figured this is never going to happen. But I really love hearing them play and the, their friendship is, is wonderful. Then suddenly one day, this would have been in November of 2018, all of these ragas appeared in my inbox. And I listened and I looked at the scores and I thought, this is just gorgeous. And Amjad said, well, I'm glad you like it because we booked a tour to do with you in two months in India in February 2019. <laughs> and I said, can't, can't we wait a little longer? This is, this is so soon. And he said, no, we, we, we found the halls. They were available in Mumbai, Calcutta, and Delhi. We booked them. And I, I thought this was a little bit nuts, but I, I was so in love with the music and have such respect for them as artists that I decided to just move mountains and change my whole life around and find a way to incorporate this. I, it was coming on the heels of just having recorded in January uh, an album with the Pacifica String Quartet called Souvenirs of Spain and Italy, which came out um, a year ago. And this was, of course, the music of Vivaldi, Baccarini, and Mario Castanuevo Tedesco. So I, I had no time in January and really only had three weeks to to immerse myself in learning North Indian classical music. I fortunately had been listening for years. I'd, I'd loved this music since I was in college, but it's another thing to play it. And that's the genius of Amjad Ali Khan, is that he finds a way to bring Western artists into his world by a, a notation process and an arrangement process that, that allows us to sort of skip those decades of study and, and just go right in. I think with any other guitarist, it probably would not have uh, gone quite as smoothly as it did with you. Well, what really helped is having had years, almost 20 years of playing with percussion before, uh, working with Gaudencio Tiago de Mello in our, in our Latin American projects. And we would perform and record together, and he would play all kinds of organic percussion instruments. So that was not foreign to me. I've worked with so many improvisational uh, players, people who are so skilled at what they do, inventing on the spot, like Stanley, Stanley Jordan or Steve Vai from the rock world or Nancy Wilson from rock. And um, yeah. it, it, again, doesn't phase me to, to immerse myself in these different kinds of genres where I'm called upon to do something that is really out of the box and not at all in in cl traditional classical music. So I just uh, it was able in, in rehearsing with them, I was struck by how even my training with Rosalind Turek for 10 years of Baroque performance practice was very helpful in figuring out ways to embellish in the slow elops of three of the ragas. The ragas are called By the Moon, Love Avalanche, Romancing Earth, and Sacred Evening. And three of those have opening slower intros where each performer does something different of, of their own accord. And again, all, all of this background really helped to give me guidance and the skills that I needed to, to do something that was still totally different. And I'm grateful to Amjad and his sons for welcoming me into that world. And it was one of the most fascinating collaborations I've ever had. And, and you know what surprised me was the evening of our first concert, I did not expect that I when I was opening with a, a Spanish piece that I played all my life thousands of times, Asturias by Albanese, that I would suddenly hear it in a, in a new way that I'd never experienced before. This was opening night in India, and there I am hearing this work. Suddenly, I'm, I'm 
feeling the sensation of this, the gypsies from India that migrated across different lands and landed in Spain and became, many of them, part of the Spanish flamenco tradition, which, of course, influenced the Spanish composers we know today, from Albanese, Granados, Turinos, Turina, and uh, Falla, and others. And all of that suddenly came into play with this sense of unity with Indian, North Indian classical music and the Spanish tradition. I'd, I'd never expected that. Well, I would say that's one of the hallmarks of what you do is um, finding all the connections between all these different genres of music. And it's wonderful for us that you're able to uh, record them and make them available. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful in a time when the world is suffering from the effects of this terrible pandemic to be able to share music, even if I can't be there in person, but it's, it's needed in a way for comfort and healing more than ever before. And when the Strings for Peace was titled back a year ago, we never envisioned it would be released at a time where this was so poignant and, and really so relevant. I assume you're staying safe and healthy where I, you I'm are. I'm totally safe and healthy. I'm jogging along the river where I live uh, in New York City, which is just a block away. I'm eating healthfully. I'm continuing my transcendental meditation, which is something I practiced since I was a teenager. And a, another reason I was inspired to visit India, because th that practice originated there thousands of years ago. And I'm just staying focused on things that I'm grateful for in my life and that I am glad to have experienced in finding new ways of being connected and sharing with others. Guitar Sharon has been two new albums out now, Affinity and Strings for Peace. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your music and spending time to, to talk about it here on FM 91. Thank you so much, and it is always a joy to, to talk with you. Bye.